live streaming on the YouTube channel of Dynamic Research on Urban Morphology. I'm going to provide the link to that streaming in a few seconds, as long as when it begins streaming on the YouTube channel. Yes, it has started, so we can stop. And uh, so, Benvenido Vitor. Um, my 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 Portuguese is really bad. It's it sounds so much Galician. Anyhow, we are really pleased to host you at Ozegin, even though virtually, if ever you would like to come here physically, you would be also always very welcome. And I think we do have an Erasmus agreement with your university, so that might be an option for your mobility if you would like to do so in the future. Um, Iman Saidi, who is a master's student at Ozegi University, is also helping as a tutor or assistant in the class, is going to introduce Vitor. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so I will start with introducing our guest today. Vitor Oliveira is the, pres is the president. Am I not muted? Okay. Uh, Vitor Oliveira is the president of the International Seminar on, Ur on Urban Form, ISUF, and the president of the Portuguese Language Network of Urban Morphology, PNUM. He is principal researcher with aggregation at the Research Center of Territory, Transports, and Environment, CITTA, FUUP, and professor assistant auxiliar of urban morphology and urban planning at ULP. He's an architect has had the master, master's in planning and design of the built environment and PhD in planning in planning and civil engineering. He's an associate editor of Urban Morphology, advisory editor of the Urban Book Series, and founding editor of the Revista de Morphologia Urbana. His research, his research area are urban morphology, urban planning, architecture, and cities. In, in these research areas, he has authored more than 200 publications and, com and communications, including about 40 papers in international peer-reviewed peer -review journals listed in Scoptus or ISE, namely the highly cited evaluation and urban planning adv advances and prospects. He has been working in different research projects supported by national and international funding, including Knowledge Alliance for Evidence-Based Urban Practices, KAEBUP. And he has been part of several scientific and organizing committees of international conferences, including the 21st International Seminar of Urban Forum, chair of the conference. In 2016, he published Urban Morphology, an introduction of the study of physical form in cities, uh, a textbook on urban morphology taught by, the, taught by the author in courses in 10 universities in Portugal, Brazil, Spain, China, and most recent of which uh, Zhejiang University. In the last 10 years, he published Teaching Urban Morphology, a GWR, White Hand, and the Historical Geographical Approach to Urban Morphology, Morphological Research in Planning, Urban Design, and Architecture, as well as the Portuguese transla translation with Claudia Monteiro of the classic uh, Anwick North, Northumberland Study of Town Plan Analysis. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Imane, uh, for your kind words. Um, thank you for inviting me, Alessandro. And um, yes, I, I will definitely uh, would like to visit to visit you in, in Istanbul. So uh, let's try to do it uh, in the near future. So I will start uh, sharing my screen. Do, do you see it already? Yes, okay. Uh, so, um, my talk today, um, this eclectic view of urban morphology, which I have to add with a central focus on the historical geographical approach and on convenient thought, um, it, it starts from uh, a lecture that I gave uh, last June in Rome um, in a summer school that was organized by Giuseppe Strappa. So today I am 
revisiting uh, this uh, PowerPoint and I'm adding some, uh, some few things which I think are important. Uh, but I try, I will try to highlight these additional thoughts without going into um, much detail because as we have agreed, I, I would like to keep it uh, in, in one hour. So um, this eclectic view, this presentation of, of an eclectic view um, can also be taken uh, by uh, this question. What do we know about urban form? Um, and uh, for this collection of very important things that we know on urban form, I would like to take uh, some different authors. Uh, so this is the reason of the title, uh, An Eclectic View. Um, for answering this question, what do we know about urban form, which is a very simple, uh, apparently very simple question, but uh, very difficult to answer, I would uh, structure my presentation in these uh, three parts. First, um, I would like to give you a comprehensive framework for description and explanation of the physical form of cities. And this comprehensive framework is mostly designed by M.R.G. Cons and, and by uh, Jeremy Whitehead. Um, then I will go into um, an additional level of detail talking about measurements and classification of the different elements of urban form. And finally, uh, I will talk about the possibility of moving from analysis to design, which is something that I'm sure uh, that Alexandro Camis has been exploring uh, with you in his, uh, in his lessons. So, when I, when I gave that talk in, in June in Rome, um, I used essentially these uh, seven authors or uh, pairs of, of authors. Um, and today, my main focus will be on this. But um, as I was looking again to, to, the, to the PowerPoint, um, for preparing this, uh, this, this talk today, I thought that I could also give you some uh, very uh, brief thoughts on an additional uh, set of, of authors, which I think, although some of them are not really urban morphologists and others are, are very far from urban morphology, I think that in this position, uh, in my, um, in my uh, narrative, uh, they, they had some, some important things to the authors that I've used in, uh, July, in June in uh, Sapienza. So this would be the, the first set of authors that I would like to mention even before I go into, into concept. And um, by a coincidence, by a, a, a great coincidence, when I, to, when I logged in today, I was uh, hearing, uh, my camera was turned off, but I was hearing Alessandro talk, talking with one student. And I, I was thinking, and they were talking about um, the possible relations between different housing types in different geographical and cultural contexts. And I was thinking about these two books, uh, which give us uh, a very comprehensive and systematic reading of, in the case of Morris, of the different urban forms and their transformation over time. I think it's a, a wonderful single volume on the history of urban form worldwide. And although they were not written um, with that purpose, of course, um, this book by Schoenhauer, 60,000 60, Years of Housing, complements Morris' book in, a, in an incredible way because it goes 
inside the buildings, especially inside the houses. So um, these uh, two books work um, amazingly to, in, to, to, give us a, to give us an idea of the past of our urban forms as uh, humanity. Uh, the third book uh, by Paul Bayrock, um, it, it gives us uh, an economic dimension on this evolution of urban form. So uh, this would be uh, a first set of, of books that I think um, are really important for us to give us an idea of our collective evolution of urban form over 6,000 years. Uh, th this is our, our legacy, our urban legacy. But of course, for us to, uh, to progress, to develop our knowledge, we must uh, go from this very large set of case studies to a much reduced set, or in the case of Konzen, which I would like to, to start my presentation, um, focusing on one uh, city. And this city or town, or settlement, as you prefer. So this is a town in England uh, named uh, Annick. And, um, but uh, one thing that I, I would like to start by, by saying, uh, the case study is important, of course, but what Konzen was trying to, to do here uh, when looking at this very small settlement in the north of England was to understand what was happening in terms of physical form, of course, what was happening in Anik, but could also be applicable to other places. So he was looking for the general, looking at the particular, okay? So some of the things that are at the core of the Anik book, are also relevant for my city, Porto, and I'm sure that some of them are also useful to understand a very different city like Istanbul. Um, so uh, I'm sure that when Konzen started to think about um, doing this book, he faced some um, simple but very important questions like uh, how to address such a complex urban landscape uh, uh, as this. Uh, what should it take on board? And what are the elements that could be out of, of his analysis? Um, and when we do that in our uh, analysis, in our settlements, um, it's also, it, it's always very important to understand what can we add to uh, the to our collective uh, morphological knowledge. We can think of this um, selection of the elements to, to address when looking at one street like this, or when looking at uh, a very uh, high, a very, um, an aerial photograph like those that are uh, given us by uh, Google Earth. And I'm sure that uh, you agree that when we look to, um, to something like this, as complex as this, uh, it's very difficult for us to, to start analyzing. And sometimes when we look at a photograph like this, what we really see is this. So um, I would like you to, to look at the ANIC book as um, a framework that can help us to understand cities. It doesn't give you, it doesn't give us um, black and white answers. Uh, it doesn't give you a, a straightforward and easy path, but it teaches how to look at cities in a morphological way. Uh, Konzen uh, has done his research in ANIC over the 50s, and the book was published in uh, 1960. And I'm sure that you have in mind that um, this was a, 
a particularly relevant period for urban morphology and for urban studies. So at the same time, more or less at the same time, um, Muratori was publishing his notable book on Venice. Uh, we had the publication of The Image of the City by Kevin Lynch, of Townscape by Gordon Cullen, and uh, of the famous book by Jane Jacobs on the death and life of great American cities. Why were these uh, notable researchers, and um, in the case of, um, of Jane Jacobs, uh, a committed citizen, why were they thinking on urban form and why were they publishing these uh, books that have become classics? Because at the time it was already evident that something was very wrong with modernist planning. Something was very wrong with the way our planners and architects were designing our cities. And all these authors have this uh, reaction against uh, this um, status quo of planning and architecture. In the case of Jane Jacobs, this is quite evident because uh, in the first sentence of her book, she explicitly says that the book is a reaction against uh, modernist planning. So um, I would say that uh, Consen's book gives us uh, perhaps one of the most comprehensive frameworks to understand the physical form of cities. This framework includes both the functional and the morphological uh, dimension of the city. First, exploring the economic and social significance in a regional context, and that is what you see in this, um, in this image, and then um, analyzing the townscape as a combination of town plan, building fabric, and uh, building utilization or uh, uh, land and building utilization or land uses more, more simply. Um, the idea of the town plan has a central role in this framework. Um, the town plan would be the topographical arrangement of an urban built up area in all its man-made features. And it included the system of streets, um, that you see here in this figure. It included the plots that you also see in the figure and um, the position of buildings on plots facing the street, which we don't see in this figure. This, uh, this focus on, on the town plan as a whole was an innovation when um, Konzan published this book. Um, Urban form studies, uh, particularly coming from geography, and Konzan was a geographer, were mostly focused on streets. So it would be like um, the, the, the current focus of space syntax, for instance, um, and uh, focused on, on buildings, on trying to classify buildings into building types. But the importance of the plots for the structuring of the settlement was being ignored. And giving importance to plots and taking the whole set, streets, plots, and buildings, was something completely new uh, at the time. Um, but Konzen looked not only, only at the town plan, but also at uh, the building fabric and at land uses. So in the morphological analysis of the townscape, the town plan as a priority as it constitutes the structure for uh, the other man-made features. And it provides the link both to the site and to the past existence of the town. And what you see here is a, a simple map that is representing the different uh, morphological periods of, of the city with uh, different uh, colors and shades of, of green, of uh, gray. 
Konzen uh, analyzed the settlement at uh, very different scales. And this would be the minimum scale of analysis. So what we are looking here at this figure is um, to the life of one plot. In the left image, you see the location of this plot in ANIC. So ANIC is, has this um, central triangle, which is the core of, uh, of the settlement. Uh, here you have one street, Fankel Street, and the location of the plot. And what you see in the right side of the slide is the same plot. Okay, we are not looking at different plots. It's the same plot in six time periods, starting in the mid 18th century. In that first um, time period, you, you can see, uh, first, the, the plot is a, is a very, very narrow and deep plot with, uh, with a building facing Fankel Street. Then when you look at 1827, you see that some additional constructions have been built. But the most striking uh, transformation is when we look at this map of mid 19th century, you can see that a high number of very small precarious houses have been built in the back of the plot. These were houses for uh, workers that were coming to Anik. Why? Because uh, Anik was um, being fueled by uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution. And because at the same time in Ireland, there was a great crisis with, uh, with food. So uh, many people had to, to leave Ireland. And this was the answer uh, that Anik was giving to this problem of housing. Um, as you can imagine, living here was really uh, a hard uh, challenge. And um, with time, and when you look at uh, the two next maps, uh, it, it's more or less the same thing. But when you get to the mid-20th mid century, we can see that all the back of the plot was clean, probably because it, it was not um, to tolerable for the Annex society to have people living in such uh, bad conditions of, of housing. So what we have here is the life of a plot represented uh, as this house was owned by uh, bourgeois. Uh, Konzen called this uh, the burgage cycle. This would be the minimum level of analysis. So uh, Konzen gives us a lot of detail of what is happening in these plots. But, and this was just to reinforce the need to, to go inside, to go inside the street block to understand the, um, the structure, the internal structure of, uh, of plots. And here I was lucky enough to, to be presented to, to Anik uh, by Jeremy Whitehand, and we were getting inside of one of these um, street blocks. But as I was saying, um, Konzen offers uh, another level of an analysis, at, let's call it a, an intermediate scale of analysis. So here he is not looking at plot by plot, but is looking at a, a larger picture. Um, and is trying to identify the degree of homogeneity that exists between the different parts of, of the city. So um, you have here a first division of different parts. So Kozen identifies three different parts. And it's important to say that most of these parts are made of housing. Um, you have three parts, each with one color. And um, for instance, the green area, in the green area, you would find a, a pattern, a particular pattern of combination of streets, plots, and buildings that was not present in, for instance, the red area or the gray area. Um, Konzen called this planned units. Um, I'm sure that uh, Alexander Kamis has talked to you about urban tissues 
Um, the idea is similar. There are some differences. Perhaps the most important difference is that uh, the identification of these plan units, which would later be called morphological regions, as a very particular method to uh, for the for their identification, but I don't have time to elaborate on that. Um, and another important thing is that this identification of three different plan units uh, doesn't tell us the whole story. So we could continue within each of these units, and if you will careful, that's what Consent is doing. We could continue to identify subunits. So, for instance, within this uh, plan unit that is called Old Town, Consen identifies five plan units, and it could continue like that um, if uh, the complexity of the urban landscape would allow it. Another, another scale of analysis um, would be given by the concept of fringe belt. Um, the concept of fringe belt was first proposed by one of Konzen's teachers back in Germany when he was a student, um, um, a researcher called Herbert Louis. But the concept was then elaborated by Konzen and as you will see, much more elaborated by uh, Jeremy Whiten. Uh, but here, when we are looking at ANIC, what, what is the importance of um, the concept of fringe belt for our view? Um, the fringe belt concept is mostly about processes. It's also about form, but I think that the most important idea is about processes. It tells us that uh, the rhythm of evolution of a city is very different. Um, it's, it's like our daily life. Sometimes we have good days, sometimes our days are not as good as the former. So um, sometimes the city is growing, it's very powerful, but uh, in other moments, the, the city could be, uh, could be suffering some stagnation or it, it could even go through some decay to some uh, shrinkage. And what um, these researchers uh, give us with, with a great rigor is that these rhythms of evolution, of past evolution, can be found on the ground and can be found on the ground today. So what, what this map gives us is uh, a map of rhythms of evolution. Um, every time that you see a um, gray area with this dots, it corresponds to uh, a moment of growth. But every time that you see plots represented in black, in red, or in green, it represents a stop, a stop in the growth. For instance, when you, when you look at this first fringe, and fringes correspond to the moments of slow growth or even uh, decay, you, you can, well, you have to trust me, um, but uh, I tell you that here you, we have the city wall and so the city wall was a physical element that constrained this expansion. So what we have here around the city wall is a first fringe belt. Um, this fringe belt is made of very different elements of urban form when we compare it to what is happening in the first residential area. Uh, so first, the street system would not be so dense as in a residential area. The plots would be larger and the land uses would be radically different. So there is almost the absence of housing. And what we have in there uh, is uh, the construction of institutional buildings or industrial buildings or even uh, some empty spaces. And so it, it's... Um, I wouldn't say it's easy because it's not, but these rhythms of evolution are identifiable when we look at the, the present form of cities. 
Um, Konsen was trying to understand this in a small settlement, as I told you, in Anik. Then he analyzed this black uh, fringe, which is uh, the city of Newcastle. And as you can imagine, the complexity grows. But uh, in 1967, Jeremy Whitehead started to develop uh, the idea of, of fringe belt in, in a much more elaborated way. And his first contribution in 1967 was to study the whole conurbation that was surrounding uh, Newcastle. So it's the time side conurbation and it, it encompasses not only Newcastle, but also some eight settlements that were spread in this area. And what Jeremy gave us is a very complex picture of the formation of fringe belts, not only in these nine settlements, but also in the conurbation as a whole. So as you can imagine, the complexity is increasingly higher. In the early 70s, um, Jeremy Whitehand uh, gave another important contribution, perhaps more important than enlarging the, the geographical complexity. He related the concept with urban economics, particularly with urban rent theory and building cycles. And um, around two decades ago, and th this slide is representing that, two decades ago, he started to explore the ecological significance of the concept. He did that with uh, one of his PhD students, Michael Hopkins, and they showed in the case of, of Birmingham, what, how different is um, the fringe belt in relation to the other areas in terms of all its ecological complexity. So here we are looking, for instance, at uh, the distribution of uh, the tree population within uh, fringe belts, and uh, they were comparing it with all the other areas that were uh, present in Burma. Finally, uh, the last um, very important contribution of Jeremy Whitehead to this Kinsinian uh, framework would be um, the agents of change. Um, of course, that uh, when um, Kozen was studying um, Anik or any other of the settlements that he has analyzed in England, he was thinking about agents, but um, it was Jeremy Whitehead who brought them to the center of the morphological debate in a very explicit way. So here we are taking again Birmingham as an example, and he is uh, looking at what happens within a sample of um, 30 plots, and he is trying to understand in a very considerable detail what are the processes that are taking place in the life of each of these plots, and how do agents uh, transform the physical form of a, a part of the city. So uh, in his look at agents, he considers such different things as the types of change that take place, the timing of these changes, which are the types of agents involved, which are the relations that uh, are established between them, where do they came from, uh, are they always in the same uh, direction or do we have situations of conflict? So, of conflict. So it's all these uh, things that are being considered by Jeremy Whitehead when he talks about agents of change. So let me remind you, we are in the middle of um, of this talk and let you let me remind you uh, the title of the talk an, an eclectic view of urban morphology um, i believe that um, 
scientific knowledge as the city itself is a collective construction that is developed over time. And so I would like to bring um, a different uh, perspective to this, uh, to this eclectic view of urban morphology. Um, I hope that I made evident that um, in Kanzinian and in uh, Whitehead uh, view, uh, the town plan was at the center of, uh, of their uh, discussion. And within the town plan, they looked at streets as the most structural and persistent element of urban form. If we look at the theories and methods that um, Bill Hillier and Julian Hansen started to develop in the late 70s at UCL, uh, we also see that the street is the main element of, of analysis. And although there are many differences between um, the proposal by Conzen and by Whitehead in relation to, to this one, we can see that there is this common ground. They, all of them give a very important role to streets to understand the physical form of cities. And I would like to talk a bit about this um, innovative view that uh, both Hillier and Hansen gave us um, in the late uh, 70s and early um, 80s. Um, one of the most important things is that they place the relation between space and society at the center of discussion. To understand space, the authors move uh, the focus from surfaces to spaces. And um, for those of you who are architects, you can imagine uh, how difficult this is to start stop looking at surfaces, which is at the core of most architectural analysis, and look only at spaces. When Hillier and uh, Hansen uh, developed their efforts to understand society, they analyze how people use space, how they navigate through space, how they organize their activities in space. Um, one thing, one aspect that is at the core of this thought is um, the movement of people. So for space syntax proponents, a great city or a great part of a city would be uh, a city that has a, a set of streets that have people. Uh, so uh, a good city or a good part of the city would be a specialized society. And a good criteria to measure this is the movement of, of people. Um, this idea is mostly expressed in a paper published in 1993 called uh, Natural Movement. And uh, one of the things that they told us here is that um, it is the accessibility of the street system and not the land uses that is the main generator of movement patterns of movement patterns and this again like the change of focus from um, surfaces to space is a radical uh, change Uh, one, one key idea uh, for space syntax is uh, the idea of spatial configuration. Um, and this relates how we look at one space with how it relates to all other spaces in a uh, system. So this could be explained at the urban scale, but I think it's easier to, to do it in the architectural scale. What we have here is um, three buildings, one in each row, 
Um, the buildings are exactly the same. They have this square shape. They have all nine rooms. The rooms have all the same size. And what changes, the only thing that changes in these three spatial configurations is the existence of doors. Okay. So it is just this variable that changes the space. What we see in the, in the, left, in the right column is um, a representation of these spatial configurations by graphs. So you can understand that although this configuration B and configuration C have some differences, the main difference is in relation to configuration A, a because uh, all the system is very depth. It's very hard for us to get into the two rooms that are more distant from the main entrance, which would be uh, this one and this one. So we can say that there is some level of spatial segregation in this uh, first configuration. We can use this uh, theory to analyze real places. So here, this is a, a, a real building. It's the Tate Gallery in London. And we have two representations here. Um, in the right, you can see um, the calculation of the potential accessibility just by taking into consideration the rooms and the doors, okay? It's nothing more here. It's just considering how the rooms are organized in Tate Gallery and the existence of doors, we would have this potential movement. So it's not real. It's a software that gives us this, uh, um, this pattern. Uh, what do the colors mean? I'm sure that you have seen many space syntax maps, but the closer to red you are, the strongest integration you have, the closer to dark blue you have, the more segregated are the spaces. What you see in the other part of the image is something different. Uh, it's not the potential movement, but it's the real movement. So it, it corresponds to a sample of 100 people. And each time that a person gets into Tate Gallery, a student would follow this person along Tate Gallery until he or she comes out of the building. And as you can see, there is, these are not, this, this is not the same. The result is not the same, but there is a strong correspondence between what is the real and what is forecasted by the model. So we could do the same for cities. And I'm trying to move the slide. Oh, okay. Uh, and here you would have uh, the calculation of the potential of accessibility in London. Again, uh, it's important to, to mention that what's here at stake, it's only the position of streets, how streets are organized in London. I'm looking at um, my watch and I'm seeing that the time is running. So I would go very rapidly to this slide just to mention that these ideas um, proposed by uh, Hilder and Hansen, they can be, they are surely related to, to Jane Jacobs. Uh, it's, it's a reference for, for them, uh, but it can also be related to, to Ian Gell who is also looking at is not only looking at streets, and that is a very important difference, but it is also looking at the relation between urban form and human activity, as Kevin Lynch. It's also important for us um, to look uh, when we address this relation between urban forms and human activity or society, if you want. It's also important to understand how sociologists look at this same relation because it's not exactly the, the same thing. 
look at the object from one perspective or from the other perspective. And um, why fractal cities is here? Uh, because um, Michael Batty and Paul Longley, a, a bit like Richard Sennett, were, were calling our attention to um, the danger of uh, an exaggerated order. And while Richard Sennett was arguing for the need to have disorder in cities, um, Beatty and Longley were offering us a method to look at urban forms in their apparent disorder and to be able to measure it with uh, a, a new instrument of analysis, which would be uh, fractal geometry. But going back to, to the main narrative, um, as you remember uh, from what I've said some minutes ago, um, one of the most important things in this um, approach that was proposed by Kohn's and by Whitehand is uh, the plots, is the internal organization of street blocks. And it, it's very curious to see that one of the main lines of development of space syntax is done by uh, a group of Swedish researchers that include plots on the, um, the approach that was developed initially by Hiller and Hansen. So what you see here uh, is uh, Stockholm uh, in two maps. The first map is a classic uh, space syntax analysis of, uh, of a settlement. And the second map is what these researchers proposed. They still continue to look at spatial accessibility, but for them, the most important thing is not the accessibility of streets per se, but the accessibility that streets allow us to some particular contents. And these contents would be not on streets, but on plots. So behind this, there is an idea of spatial capital that um, places the density and diversity of plots in the center of discussion. And the new method, uh, a, a new software to, uh, uh, to do this, um, mathematical analysis, something called place syntax that was designed by Alexander Stahl. So when we start talking about plots, it's inevitable to, to think of how they are aggregated into street blocks. And here I would like to bring another book that give us also some important insights on street blocks. Um, I'm talking about uh, Fort Nurpen de Lilo Alabar that was um, published by Jean Castec, Philippe Panere, and Jean-Charles de Paul. And um, there are two main messages that I would like to highlight in this eclectic view of urban morphology. The first message that uh, they try to, to give us is that um, over the last 150 years, there was a radical transformation on the organization of our settlements. We moved from street blocks very progressively, but very uh, in a very radical way to isolated buildings as the main actor on the urban scene. Another second, another um, main idea would be not on this transformation. And I have to say that the transformation is illustrated in the book with some key planning proposals that were developed since um, the intervention in Paris by Ausman. Another idea is not in this transformation, but in the first case in the intervention of Haussmann in Paris. Um, 
So what Castex and their and their colleagues uh, tell us is that although Haussmann was restructuring Paris with street blocks, although here we still have the street block as the main form of organization of a settlement, the nature of this street block was very different. It was very different because it did not exist as a process. Uh, so when we look at old Paris, we see that the street blocks are made of very different things that occur in very different time periods. So we have a process. Here, the street block, each street block is one single thing and it doesn't have a lot of uh, diversity. So the nature of street blocks was very different. So this idea of street block as a process is also uh, visible in Canadian and, and Maffei, of course, which you probably would be most familiar to. And all these authors, the French and the Italians, they give us this uh, message. The main, perhaps the main role of the street block in urban life is to its existence as a process um, and not so much as, as a form. So I'm getting into the final part of the talk and I really have to rush. Uh, here you, you have uh, another representation of street block as, as a process, but this map by Giuseppe Stappa also highlights uh, the buildings. So we, we now see the diversity of buildings. Um, when we look at a settlement, and we are looking at perhaps one of the most complex settlements on earth with a, a very important urban history. Well, it can be compared to Istanbul, of course. Um, when we look at something like this, um, it's, it's very difficult to understand how we can analyze these buildings. Um, architectural skills usually um, highlight the buildings that are designed by famous architects. And they convince their students that if they understand these buildings of uh, star architects, they would have a reasonable knowledge of uh, the architecture of the city. And that is absolutely false. What my colleagues, including Alessandro Camis, uh, proposes is something that is much more interesting. We can look at all the diversity of buildings and this diversity, oops, and this diversity can be reduced into uh, a number of, of types. So I will run a bit. Um, these types, uh, they are abstract constructions. So when we look, for instance, at, at this image, um, we are still in Rome and Canigia and Maffei reduce, proposes to reduce a high number of buildings into only seven types. Um, of course, that we are ignoring some differences between them. Uh, each type represents a set of buildings that are not exactly the same, that is obvious. But the type tries to gather the structural similarities between a high number of buildings and deliberately ignores some characteristics that are, are not as important as as those. Um, another key concept that our Italian colleagues give us is that the types, the different types, can be rela related into an evolutionary process. And what we see here is something more complex than just the identification of seven types, is a history of buildings in Rome through this prog progression of one type to the other. 
Uh, Canigia and Mafe did also this to Genova, and Genova is, is very important because uh, it illustrates another important aspect of uh, the typological process, is that it is an open structure. So we can use the typological process not only to look at past and present, but also to understand how we can root our design of future buildings into this typological process. Again, um, what is at stake in the typological process is the structural characteristics of the buildings. So when we look at this neighborhood designed by Canidia in the mid eighties, there are some um, physical similarities uh, that can be um, related to all Genova, but that is the, not the most important. The most important thing are the structural physical characteristics. So the exterior look of the building could be a bit different if myself or Alexandro Caviz was designing the buildings according to this approach. Another relevant example is uh, Muratori in Venice. Here, um, it's about the design of a whole uh, settlement. I will move it rapidly because I see that I only have five minutes and I would like to, to get to Konzan again. I will skip this. So um, I hope that despite the fast rhythm of, of, my, of my presentation, um, I hope that I, I, I wouldn't say convince you, but um, at least um, made uh, some of you curious about uh, this um, uh, integration of this morphological, uh, different morphological perspectives, starting from that uh, basis, from that first layer that is offered by, by Konzen. Um, I'm really convinced that uh, the comprehensive view that is proposed in ANIC is um, able to receive contributions from very different morphological uh, perspectives. And that is, I would say, the main message of uh, my talk today. Um, I would like to conclude with this um, with these two uh, figures. Perhaps most of you, if not all, uh, perhaps most of you have never seen these uh, these figures before. Um, the first one is a modernist complex that was proposed in 1965 for that central triangle of Anik. So. As you are guessing, uh, the proposal is the usual, to demolish everything and to create a modernist complex, pretty similar to what was being done in the 60s in England and in, in many parts of our planet. This proposal was approved by, by the local authority, so it was to be built, but um, uh, a citizens' movement uh, was created, and Konzen was at the center of, of this movement, to avoid this uh, demolition. And although the plan was already uh, approved, um, these citizens were able to convince the local authority to go one step back. The second image is a very, very tiny uh, book that was published in 2017 that, uh, in a way, um, says thanks to uh, the citizens and uh, to this urban morphologist that, through his analysis, he was able to conserve this uh, incredible uh, urban landscape. So thank you for listening. I will stop sharing. And I don't know if we have time for one question or if we just uh, leave. It's up to you, Kamis. Uh, Alexander. 
We can take one question. Estou uh, muito obrigado. And I would like to make one comment. Out of the, the geogra uh, historical geographical school of woodman morphology, uh, there's one thing I would like to uh, bring home, okay, from this lecture, is the notion of morphological agent. One group of people or one person who is responsible for a physical transformation of space which is pretty obvious in planning and design. So you have to talk with those people, you know, out there when you're doing the design process. Oh, what's well, obvious, but some architects forget about this, you know, <laughs> the relationship sure. with morphological <laughs> agents, the different morphological ag agents, certain times oppose one to the other one. <clears throat> but also a reverse engineering, the relationship there is between urban form and morphological agents so that you can determine by looking at the urban form, the history of people. Sure. And that belongs a little bit more to the historical method, especially the nouvelle histoire approach, where sources are not documents, but physical, or let's say the city considered as a physical document of the life of the people who built that city. Thank you, muito obrigado. And we can take one question or comment. Please raise your hand if you have one. Any comment or question from the audience, both in the classroom and on Zoom? We are in a physical classroom right now in Ozuki. I, I think I saw Luai Al Hussein with the camera. Yes, um, it's me. Hi, I'm here. Uh, so, my question goes to uh, to Professor Oliveria. Like, I'm. I'm actually. I want to just uh, make it uh, clear because I. I quite understand from your saying that how can we integrate both of the space syntax and what's happening in the school of uh, of the space syntax and what's happening in the school of urban morphology that leads the plan and the formation plan of the of the city as a transformation as a physical identity. But what we see in in the space syntax, we only see. Uh, a 2D representation or the graphical representation of the research on the geographical scale. So is it is it the point that, you know, is there the, the what is the pros and cons of each one of the studies from your point of view? Is it the, the urban morphology? Is it a, a completing each other, these two studies? Is it, is it a way of saying that both of the study can generate a one, by integrating these two methodologies can integrate, uh, can result in a, in a complete study that aims at you know, merging the physical identity of the place by looking at the uh, entity, the spatial entity, and one that it looks at the geographical or the syntactical view from the upper level of the, of the maps. So is, is it correct what I'm, I'm saying that paraphrases what you have been proposing? Yes, I think your, your question is, um, it's a very important one. Uh, well, first, let me say, because I, I, I'm not sure if I said it in, in, in the beginning, why am I proposing uh, this eclectic view? Uh, because I think that cities are too complex to be explained by one single perspective, no matter how brilliant these authors are, and I'm really convinced that Konzen was a brilliant researcher, Jeremy White was a brilliant researcher, as, as Bill Hillier and Julian Hansen. Um, but I think that for us to, to understand the complexity of the, the surrounding urban landscape, we must uh, benefit from all the knowledge that we can get. Um, depending on the problem that you have at hand, uh, being it a research problem or a professional uh, problem, if you want to act on the urban landscape, uh, perhaps some of these approaches can give you uh, different things. So in one occasion, perhaps the best option 
would be to use something proposed by space syntax or something that is proposed by an individual researcher. So all the, the, the morphological knowledge is not contained in this uh, mainstream approaches. You will find uh, important morphological knowledge in many different people. Um, so the diversity is a strong asset of, of our field. Um, we, when, when you say that um, space syntax is, is focusing on just the bidimensional thing, um, I would say that it's even more than that. They are focusing just on one aspect of one element of the bidimensional thing, which is uh, the street system. The, the pattern of streets, squares, and gardens. And because of that, on the one hand, they are ignoring very important things of, of cities. But on the other hand, they are very, very good in giving us as much information as possible on that street system. So depending on what you want to do in your research or in your professional activity, you might find this knowledge usable or in some occasions you, you might find that you need space syntax but you also need some other things and in other occasions you might think that uh, this knowledge that is proposed by space syntax for your problem is absolutely unuseful so it depends on what what you need to do um, my main advice if i can is to um, try to know as much morphological perspectives as you can and try to use the ones that are more suited to what you want to do in that particular moment. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. We have to close now because other lectures are gonna happen in the same space here. I would like to again, thank Vitor Oliveira for his um, uh, irreplaceable contribution and also renew the invitation to join us here in Istanbul and eat fish whenever he likes. Uh, and uh, thanks to everyone else who had the patience of listening to the lecture. And also, I'd like to thank Iman Saidi for the uh, presentation she has done of Vitor.